Very good morning to you all. The Lord be with you. Welcome to everybody here, particularly if this is your first time at St. John's, you're very, very welcome to join us this morning. A welcome also to people joining us on the live stream. Uh, Just in case you haven't realised, Janet Baker has fallen over and hurt herself in the churchyard, which is why there's been so much uh, toing and froing. So uh, I think we're just going to pause, and before we go any further, let's just uh, bring Janet to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you so much for your loyal servant, Janet. We pray for her now. We thank you for the people caring for her in the churchyard at the moment. We just ask that uh, it might be nothing more than bruising. Watch over her, care for her, and do bring the trained medics here quickly to, uh, so that they can work out what needs to be done. But just hold her in your arms at the moment, we pray. Amen. Just a couple of uh, notices to go through. Um, so next week, week beginning the 8th, I think, it's, is it the 8th or the east? Yes, the week, week beginning the 8th is going to be a busy week. On the 8th in the afternoon at 2 o'clock, there's going to be the funeral of Alec Mason. And then on uh, the following morning at half past 10, we've got a memorial service for Leslie Clark. And then 2 o'clock on Friday, this will all come out in my email this week, Two o'clock on Friday, we've got the um, memorial service for Richard Gooding. So uh, do remember all those families in your prayers. And uh, next week's service is going to be an all-age service, and uh, we're going to be celebrating Epiphany. It's one day after Epiphany, so we're going to be celebrating the arrival of the wise men. So we'll uh, we'll leave uh, the baby Jesus and uh, and the gifts and uh, the star out for that service, but do come along to that. We are going to stand to sing our first song of praise. If you have a hymn book, it's number 52, and a great reminder of Jesus coming into the world and that he lives still today because he lives. I can face tomorrow because 
Amen. Please do sit down. Because he lives, I can face the future. We're going to come to the Lord now in confession. But first, a passage of scripture from Isaiah 1. The lovely promise of the Lord. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, They shall be as white as snow, though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So with that promise ringing in our ears, let's confess all the things we've done wrong. Please respond to the words in bold. For all the things we have done wrong in the past against God and against people, we now ask the Lord and one another to forgive us. Father God, yours are the seasons and the ages. All good things come from you alone, but we have ignored you. We have not looked after your world. We have not treated each other with respect. For this we are sorry. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Jesus Christ, you are the beginning and the end of all that is, including our lives. Make a new beginning with all of us. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you breathe your spirit on all creation. Make our old world new again. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God loved the world so much. He sent his son to die in our place. May the Lord assure us of his forgiveness And may his loving kindness guide us each day and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. And a special prayer for today. Do join in with me. Almighty God, who wonderfully created us in your own image and yet more wonderfully restored us through your Son, Jesus Christ, grant that as he came to share in our humanity so we may share the life of his divinity, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's not quite New Year, but we are thinking a bit about new beginnings today and what the Lord can do for us. And we're going to come in a minute to our Bible readings. But before that, let's sing, The Virgin Mary Had a Baby Boy.
Do sit down, and uh, Lisa's going to come and read the Bible to us. Just to say, um, a couple of people have said hello watching us online. Hello to Pat Goodridge and Linda Brown, and to anyone else joining us. The first reading is from Galatians chapter 4 and verses 4 to 7. Galatians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. The second reading is from Luke chapter 2 and verses 15 to 21. Luke chapter 2 beginning at verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. This is the word of the Lord. We'll sing again number 764, While Shepherds Watched.
please do sit down. Well, let's pray, shall we? Father God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, for what he came to do, and please open up our hearts and minds as we just think through the implications of that a little more now. Amen. So we're going to be looking at our first Bible reading today, and that's on page 117 of the Church Bibles. Uh, There should be some at the end of the pews, so do grab one and with me. But, you know, there's a story uh, told by Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a famous Baptist minister in the 1800s, and apparently one of his fellow ministers once went to the house of an elderly lady. He went to help her out financially because the lady was in debt and she couldn't afford her rent. So this minister took some money around as a gift from the church's poor relief fund, and he knocked on the lady's door very strange. No answer. He tried again. Still no answer. He tried a third time and no answer. But apparently the lady had been in there all the time. Later on, when asked, why did you not answer the door? She said, well, I heard the knocking, but I just assumed it was the rent man come to evict me. And Spurgeon used this story to illustrate what we're so often like when we hear God knocking on the door of our hearts. We quickly jump to the wrong conclusion. I think he's come as the rent man. He's come about our spiritual debt. In the Bible, our sin is often portrayed as debt to God. And when we hear God knocking, well, we assume we're in big trouble. We know we've failed, and so we want to hide to avoid God's judgment. And we see that right the way back in Genesis chapter 3, don't we? With the very, very first rebellion against God, Adam and Eve, How do they first respond when they hear God walking in the garden? They hide. But the silly thing is, of course, God does not come knocking, seeking payment for our sins. At least not until the second coming of Christ. Of course, on that day he will. But at the moment, God comes knocking with a gift. He offers to pay off our debt. And that's what this Bible reading we're looking at today is all about. God's popped round to pay a visit. And he's bought a gift. It's good news. He's not come as the rent man. Not at all. So in our first reading, page 1170, uh, we start in verse 4. When the time had fully come, God sent his son. Well, that's reference to what we're celebrating the last few weeks. God has sent his son into the world. And notice how the verse continues. God sent his son born of a woman. Born of a woman, it's astonishing. And it's a mysterious truth that we celebrate each Christmas. In Jesus, God became one of us. God sent Jesus who willingly humbled himself to be born of a woman. And we think about it, the Lord Jesus, he'd been enthroned with his father for all eternity. He'd created this world. His hands flung stars into space and yet he humbled himself to become a person like you and me, born as a little baby to the Virgin Mary. She had a baby boy. That truth is just mind-blowing. So why did Jesus do that? Well, of course, one reason is that Jesus came into the world to reveal God to us. John chapter 1 tells us all about that. But the reading here goes on to say that Jesus was born under law to redeem those under law. We come to that word redeem again. If you were here last Sunday morning, we see a lot, we saw a lot about that word redeem. It's a rescue word. A rescue, though, at a costly price, because redemption means a ransom price needs to be paid. So Jesus came to earth at Christmas on a rescue mission to redeem. That's why he was born. 
Now, the wider context of this passage describes humanity outside of Jesus Christ as slaves, not slaves to another person. This slave master is far more sinister. This slave master is our sin. We're slaves to wrongdoing, our corrupted inner desires, slaves to sin, because basically it means we just can't do what is right. We can't help but do what is wrong. And even when we do what is right, we do it out of mixed motives. I was reminded of the... Uh, did anyone used to enjoy watching Friends in the 90s? Or maybe you've got it on DVD and you watch it again. There's that wonderful episode when uh, Phoebe tries to do something totally selfless. And she realises she just can't. And even when she does, she realises she, she feels so good about it. It can't be selfless. Even when we do right things, they're from wrong... Well, they're from mixed motives. And that's just how deep the problem of our sin goes. So we're slaves to sin. But this passage, Galatians says, we're also slaves to the law. What does that mean? Okay, we know the law was revealed by God in the Old Testament, and it seems to give an initial solution to the sin problem. It's obvious. Look, hear these laws, obey these laws, and you'll be put right with God. Sounds great, but there's a snag, isn't there? You try obeying the law perfectly. Just look at the Ten Commandments. I always like number ten just hanging there, just in case you haven't been caught out on the previous nine. Do not covet. Yeah, try, try, yeah, try not being jealous of anything at all your whole life. It's impossible, and that's the point. That's what the Old Testament people of God found out quickly. Obeying the law is a hard ask. It's an impossible ask. So instead of bringing freedom from sin, the law actually brings additional condemnation. So we ask, why did God give the law? Well, I think the law is there for two reasons. The first is, this is God's will for our lives. This is how we ought to live. It's a good thing. But secondly, it points out that we fail. And therefore, we're slaves who need rescuing. And sadly, so many of us fail to see that second reason. We keep kidding ourselves. Well, let's keep going back to the law, trying to slavishly obey it in order to get right with God. And then when we fail, we try even harder and we still fail. And that's why Paul says we're slaves to the law. We're held captive to it as it shouts sinner, sinner, sinner to us. And we keep trying to obey it. When actually, when we hear it shout sinner, 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 we ought to say, Lord Jesus, help me. I cannot do this. I need redeeming. Now, in New Testament times, a slave could be freed if this ransom price was paid. The price was paid to the owner of the slave. The slave could go free. Our reading tells us that Jesus came to pay the ransom price needed to set us free from slavery. That's why we sing, there is a redeemer sometimes. And at such a cost, the cost was himself dying on the cross, bearing all the consequences of our sin and our wickedness. But he pays the debt off for us. We're set free. He comes, not as the rent man, but with the ransom price to set us free. So my first point, God sent his son into the world to set us free. Jesus has set us free from slavery to sin and slavery to the law which condemns us. And that doesn't mean that we disregard the law now as irrelevant. No, it's still our guideline for how we should live. It's just not the way we're put right with God. We're put right by Jesus paying the ransom price. But the good news in these verses is that it just gets better and better, really. God sent his son into the world to enable us to become sons of God. And see how it says that? We become sons of God. That's what the redemption enables to happen. And there's three awesome benefits in this passage of being declared sons of God. The first is we're adopted into God's family. If you trust in Jesus, you have been set free to become part of God's family. And if you look at verse 6, you see how the Holy Spirit is sent into our hearts 
and he enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. Now, Abba was a, a family term back in those days in the Greek. It means calling, well, as we might say, father or daddy, whatever term we use, it's that familiar term we use of our earthly father. And we're being told we can now use that term of God himself. We're permitted to call him Abba. We can also call Jesus our brother. That's marvellous, isn't it? We can know God personally like this. I hope you've enjoyed Christmas. Christmas can be a wonderful time for families, a joyful time to be with our nearest and dearest, hopefully. Always risky saying that, isn't it? But God sending his son into the world is an invitation for us to enter into the most special family ever, to be adopted as God's child, to receive all the benefits of belonging to his family, the family of God. It's a privilege, isn't it? To call the creator of the cosmos our father. To be loved as his children in the same way that parents here love their babies. It's astonishing. I can see that uh, Holly and Lewis aren't here this morning, but they've got a lovely child, Oscar. And I went to see them in their new home in Elmswell um, just before Christmas. And uh, he's there on the floor. He's got into that crawling stage. I could not believe any child could crawl so fast. But he's shooting around like this. But just the joy on the parents' faces is, is it's just lovely. Well, the same way that those parents love Oscar, that's how God looks upon us. So God does not come knocking on the door as a debt collector. He comes knocking with the good news that our debt is paid and we're invited to join his family, become a son of God. The second awesome benefit of being declared a son of God is that this is no normal adoption. When we adopted our two boys, they joined our family they became every part of our family but one thing they didn't get is our DNA however when God adopts us as his children a change to our DNA does take place God sends the spirit of his son into our hearts and the Holy Spirit brings about change so that we can start becoming more like Jesus conform to his likeness. So you and I, if we trust in Jesus, are given this new nature as the spirit of Jesus enables us to start obeying the law in a way that we were never able to before. We're going to have a new verse for the year next week. But I hope you remember the one for 2023. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation the old has gone, the new is here. I almost thought about singing that song, I am a new creation today. But in Christ, we're new creations. We're given the DNA of God's Son. God's Holy Spirit brings new birth into our hearts. We start to be changed so that we can be conformed to the likeness of Christ, changed for the better. That's why uh, the Bible describes Christians as being born again. Finally, as sons of God, as sons of God, we're given a new destiny. Now you may wonder, why do I keep using sons of God? Surely in 2023, almost 2024, I ought to be saying children of God. It's much more PC and right, isn't it? But the Greek is deliberate. Sons of God, because in those days, who inherited the estate? The sons. And Paul is saying now, whether you're male or female, you're a son of God in the terms that you are going to inherit the kingdom of God. We are co-heirs with Christ. If you're a believer here today, the riches of heaven are yours. You're a son of God, an inheritor. So when you hear God knocking, what will you do? Will you hide, like Adam and Eve did, like that lady did, assuming it's the person come to ask you about your debt? Or will you open up the door and allow Jesus to pay the ransom price for your sin and set you free? And as free people, we enter into the family of God, we become new creations in Christ, 
and co-heirs with Jesus of the kingdom. It's our destiny as Christians when we answer the door to Christ who was born of Mary, sent by the Father out of love to redeem us. Probably getting a bit old, this illustration, but we've all had so many presents at Christmas. But don't forget the best present of all. Don't miss out on it. God is knocking on the door of your heart, seeking not payment for your debt, but to pay it off, to redeem you, and then to invite you on this great journey of faith as part of his family, enabling you to grow into this new nature and looking forward to all the riches of heaven. We are no longer slaves if we follow Christ. We are sons of God. Let's pray. So Father, thank you for sending the Lord Jesus into the world to be born of a woman, to redeem us from slavery to sin and the law. Thank you that we can be your children in your family forever, being changed. Just pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has not opened the door, to open the door now, to let you in. And help us to continue to grow, to become more like Jesus Christ, and to praise you daily, for you have called us to be your own. Amen. We're going to uh, sing, What Child Is This?
Well, please do sit, and I do apologise. I need to talk to the music group <laughs> more, because whatever version they use, I seem to put the wrong one up. And then I switch it round, and it doesn't matter. We enjoyed singing it anyway in the end. We're going to now pray to the Lord together. We come to our prayers this morning at the turning of the year. Behind us are the joys and the sorrows of the old year, and we look ahead to joys and challenges of the year to come. The safe arrival of a baby, a wedding, and the inevitable concerns over health, work, general circumstances. To all of this, we can bring the certainty born of past experience that God is with us in all things and he will guide and support us if we walk with him. And so we pray. Eternal God, we grieve that the futility of war and conflict doesn't seem to bring about change in national and international relations. We pray again for the leaders of nations and factions to bring about just solutions to the pain of the Middle East, the war in Ukraine and the tensions in Europe, the disturbances in Nigeria, Sudan, other parts of Africa and across Asia. We give thanks for those who are working to lessen international tension, to establish genuine peace and justice for all. We remember those who are working in situations of danger and crisis, bringing practical relief to the desperate and the dispossessed. Father, strengthen and protect them in their work and give us the grace to be peacemakers in our daily life too. In this country we have a general election to come and we pray that those who lead our national and local affairs will speak and act with integrity to build a society where all are valued and cared for. We pray for Christians in our public life that their witness will be effective in the challenging decisions they face. We give thanks for the honest work of the very many who support our daily life. And we ask that in our actions, we too will take opportunities to make life better for those around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, you came to our world as the word made flesh, a visible message of divine love living with us. We pray for all who take this message to those who do not know you, our mission partners across the world, our bishops and clergy. We give thanks for Peter and Lisa and all who contribute to our worship and witness here. We pray especially for those who share the gospel story with the children. Give them the words to make your love real to a new generation and help us all to be active witnesses to your redeeming grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, you stay with us in times of doubt, pain and death. We pray for those who face illness, anxiety for those they love or for themselves, and we give thanks for the skills and patience of those who work in our medical care and hospice settings. Bless their work. Keep them strong in the pressures they face. And at this time, we would lift to you particularly Abby, who is in hospital for the birth of her baby to be induced, for Alex, as he waits anxiously, and we pray for Janet after her fall, that it won't be serious and that she will be able to receive the treatment she needs. In our hearts, we name those we know who are going through difficult times. We remember those who have been bereaved, 
especially the families and friends of Leslie Clark, Alec Mason, Richard Gooding. Grant, Heavenly Father, to those who are unwell, in distress, fearful or sad, a real awareness of the comfort of your presence and the assurance that nothing, nothing can separate us from your love and care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God our Father, we bring our families and ourselves to you. In the coming year, through times of hope and times of difficulty, help us in all situations to listen for your voice, follow your guiding, and act as true witnesses to the love of Jesus, which all can share so that others will be drawn to know and accept that gift of redeeming love too. And these prayers we bring in his name, and we say together the prayer he gave us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Catherine. We're going to come and just have a short celebration of Holy Communion now. Uh, hopefully you've got a yellow card. If you haven't got one of these cards, do wave and uh, somebody will make sure you have one. And uh, for people who are not used to how we do things at St. John's at the moment, uh, we give a choice. Uh, we have wafers for the bread. You can receive just one of those and then you can either have it dipped in wine or you can have a shared chalice. So just point to me when you come up if you want it dipped in wine or point to Gavin here if you would like to uh, just take the bread and then have the wine in the shared cup. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night that he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. 
Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Amen.
Shall we pray? Shall we pray this sending out prayer together? Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to sing that lovely carol, 211 in the hymn books, Hark the Herald, Angel Sing. Glory be to the newborn King. Just looking at um, the last few lines there, just exactly what we've been thinking about today. Jesus came born, that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. So Father, we thank you again for the Lord Jesus, for all that he does for us. May we open the doors of our hearts, make sure that he has room within us. Amen. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.